I saw a dude. Hello everybody, welcome back to my YouTube channel. So today's case is a very interesting one and not only is the story itself super interesting, but the, the ending is very intriguing and it really leaves you thinking. So without further ado, let's just jump right into the Frank Morris, John and Clarence England's Alcatraz escape. Frank Lee Morris was born September 1st, 1926 in Washington, DC. He was abandoned by his parents when he was only 11 years old. His childhood was spent in foster homes and as an orphan, which is incredibly sad. Frank committed his first crime when he was 13 years old, and by his later teens, he had been arrested for crimes ranging from narcotics possession to armed robbery. So all extremely serious crimes and ones that, you know, you know that you should not commit. A lot of his early years, he was in jail serving lunch to prisoners. He was arrested for grand larceny in Miami Beach for... Um, with along with car theft and armed robbery. Supposedly, Frank ranked in the top 2% of the general population in intelligence. He scored a 133 in an IQ test. So he was a very smart guy. I'm surprised he got caught as often as it seemed that he did considering how high his IQ score was. Frank spent time in Florida and Georgia and then escaped from the Louisiana State Pen while serving 10 years for bank robbery, but was recaptured a year later while committing a burglary and sent to Alcatraz on J January 20th, 1960 as inmate number AZ1441. Those are one of my favorite numbers, or like that's my favorite version of a number where it's the same four words as it is backwards. I, f I know there's a name for it, I just can't remember it. John William Anglin was born May 2nd, 1930, and Clarence, his brother, was born May 11th, 1921. That's crazy, because my birthday is actually May 11th, so I don't know, kind of fun, I thought. <laughs> they came from a family of 13 kin kids in Donaldsonville, Georgia. Their parents were George Robert Anglin and Rachel Van Miller Anglin, who were both farm workers. George and Rachel moved their family to Ruskin, Florida, about two miles south of Tampa for a more reliable source of income as farm workers. In Florida, the weather tends to be pretty nice, so there's always different crops growing um, with the nice weather. I mean, it's not like they really have to worry about produce freezing, so that's why they were able to have jobs, you know, year-round. The boys were reported, reportedly inseparable as young kids. The family would head to north to Michigan to pick cherries in June. So it was kind of an annual migration that they made. They were very skilled swimmers and would impress their siblings by swimming in the frigid water of Lake Michigan while ice was still floating on the surface. So remember that. Clarence was first caught breaking into a service station when he was 14 years old. The pair started robbing banks and other establishments in the early 1950s. They never had the intention of hurting people, so they tried to make sure that the businesses were closed when they hit. They claimed that they used a weapon only once, but that it was a toy gun just to you know, fake it, that they had a weapon. In 1958, John, Clarence, and Alfred Anglin robbed the Columbia Savings Bank building in Columbia, Alabama. All of the men received 35 year sentences, which they served at Florida State Prison in Leavenworth Federal Penitentiary, Penitentiary and then at the Atlanta Pen. After repeated attempts to escape from Atlanta, John and Clarence were transferred to Alcatraz. I don't know why Alfred wasn't, he must not have been in on the plan to try to escape. They arrived on separate days, John on October 24th, 1960 as inmate, AZ1476 and Clarence on January 10th, 1961, so like almost a whole year later, and his inmate number was AZ1485. Now we also have a third guy, his name is, or excuse me, a fourth guy, yeah, Alan West. Alan was born on March 25th in 1929 in New York City and was arrested over 20 times throughout his life. He was put in prison for car theft in 1955, first at Atlanta Penitentiary and then at Florida State Prison. After an escape attempt from the Florida facility, he was transferred to Alcatraz in 1957 at the age of 28 and he was inmate AZ1335. 
So since the four men had been inmates together in Florida and Georgia, they all knew each other pretty well. Like they had sort of um, built up a rapport. They had adjacent cells in December of 1961 and that's when they began to work on their escape plan with Frank kind of acting as their leader. Like he was kind of the ringleader for the whole escape plan. Over the next six months, they worked on widening the ventilation ducts under their sinks using discarded saw blades that they found on the prison grounds, metal spoons from the mess hall, and an electric drill improvised from the motor of a vacuum cleaner. So this vacuum actually didn't work and one of the men was assigned to try to like fix it, but it can be fixed. So he just like turned it into a drill, which I mean, that takes a lot of smarts. So not something just anybody could probably do. The ceilings were about 30 feet high, but by using a maze of pipes, they climbed up and eventually pried open the ventilator at the top of the shaft. So I mean, like these guys really wanted to get out. They kept it in place temporarily by fashioning a fake bolt out of soap. They hid their work with painted cardboard and concealed the noise with Morris's accordion on top of the ambient din of music hour. Once they had the ducts wide enough to pass through, the men accessed the unguarded utility corridor directly behind their cell's tier and climbed the vacant top level of the cell block where they set up a secret workshop. Using over 50 raincoats and other stolen slash donated materials, the men made life preservers based on a design that Frank found in the March 1962 issue of Popular Mechanics. He also wrote about using um, channel buoys to indicate course and navigation hazards. So like these guys were prepping for this. And remember, Frank is the one with the really high IQ score. So it kind of makes sense that he's the ringleader and that he you know, thought of all of these things to figure out beforehand. The men also assembled a 6 by 14 foot rubber raft that was carefully stitched together by hand and sealed with liquid plastic available in the shops and heat from a nearby Oh, sorry, nearby steam pipe. Paddles were made from plywood and screws. They climbed a ventilation shaft to the roof and removed the rivets holding a large fan in place. While the men were working outside of their cells, they would use sculpted dummy heads that were made from like a handmade paper mache like mixture of soap, toothpaste, concrete dust, and toilet paper and giving them a realistic appearance with the paint from the maintenance shop and hair from the barber shop floor. They used towels and clothes piled under the blankets in their bunks and the dummy heads positioned on the pillows so it looked like they were sleeping. On the night of June 11th, 1962, everything was ready to go and the men went ahead with the plan. At 9.30 p.m., right after lights out, Frank brought the dummies down from the top of the cell block and announced that the escape would be staged that night. Alan discovered that the cement he had used to reinforce crumbling concrete around his vent had hardened, which narrowed the opening and therefore fixing the grill in its place. By the time he managed to remove the grill and rewind the hole, the other men had left without him. Clarence had tried to help Alan remove the ventilator grill by kicking at it from the outside of the cell in the utility corridor, but it was unsuccessful and so that's why ultimately they just decided that like they had to move on with their plan. Alan ended up just going back to his cell and going back to sleep. From the service corridor, Morris and the Anglins climbed the ventilation shaft to the roof. Guards had heard a large crash when the men broke out of the shaft, but nothing else was heard and they never went to investigate the noise or where it came from. While hauling all their gears, they went down 50 feet to the ground by sliding down a kitchen vent pipe, then climbed down two 12 foot barbed wire perimeter fences. Like the dedication for these men. Towards the northeast shoreline near the power plant, there was a blind spot in the prison's searchlights and gun towers, and that's where the trio inflated their raft with a concertina that was stolen from another inmate and modified to serve as like a bellows to blow it up, which is super smart. At some point after 10 p.m., investigators estimated that they boarded the raft, launched it, and departed toward Angel Island, just two miles to the north of the prison. 
No one noticed the missing inmates until the morning of June 12th because of how realistic the dummies looked. There were multiple military and law enforcement agencies conducting air, sea, and land searches over the next 10 days. On June 14th, a Coast Guard cutter picked up a paddle floating about 200 yards off the southern shore of Angel Island. On the same day and in the same general location, workers on another boat found a wallet wrapped in plastic complete with names, addresses, and photos of the Anglins' friends and relatives. On June 21st, shreds of raincoat material, which was believed to be remnants of the raft, were found on a beach not far from the Golden Gate Bridge. The next day, a prison boat picked up a deflated life jacket made from the same material 50 yards off Alcatraz Island. The FBI reported that no other physical evidence had been found, and agents assumed early on that the men had drowned. They assumed this because they found personal items that the men had in the water and figured that they would have drowned before letting them go, like the names and numbers of relatives to get a hold of, probably to help aid in their escape. No bodies had ever been found at that time, so I mean, this wasn't concluded, but it was a possibility. On July 17th, a month after they had escaped, a Norwegian ship, SS Norgevel, oh, I know, I just butchered that one, spotted a body floating in the ocean 15 nautical miles, which is 17, like, land miles, from the Golden State Bridge. The ship didn't retrieve the body, but they did report it. It was assumed that the body was one of the men who escaped, but it also could have been a 34-year-old baker who had jumped from the Golden State Bridge five days earlier. That's who the coroner thought that it was. But, you know, of course, other people think that there is reason to believe that it was one of the escapees, which, I mean, yes, fair. Later, the FBI announced their official position that while it was theoretically possible for the men to have reached Angel Island, the odds of them having survived the turbulent currents and frigid waters of the bay were negligible. Which, you know, maybe... Apparently, according to the final FBI report, Allen said that the plan was to steal clothes from a clothing store and a car after they reached land, but there were no thefts reported in Marin County within 12 days following the escape. Allen was the only conspirator that didn't participate in the actual escape, and he totally cooperated with investigation, so he wasn't charged for his role in the end, and Allen ended up, he's now since passed away. There, of course, have been reports um, of sightings of the three men that did manage to escape, but nothing has ever been confirmed, and no bodies have ever been found, so we actually do not know whether or not they made it. I thought this was a really really interesting story and this of course is just the gist of it so if you guys want more information on it i have all my case sources linked in the description box down below so definitely check them out because this is something that i think should be made into a movie because it's so good uh i really want to believe that they did make it just because it's kind of fun to root for root for them um and with how smart they were and the fact that the boys the two brothers swam in the lake michigan like while it was still cold enough for ice to be on top is incredible. And so I, I really just don't doubt that they could have made it. I think it's just fun to believe that they did and that somewhere they were living amongst, you know, just normal people. But that is it for my story today. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, please be sure to like and subscribe to my YouTube channel. But if not, that's totally fine. Thanks for hanging with me today. And if you guys have any cases that you would like me to study and just do a quick video on, make sure to leave them in the comments down below. I have a whole list of stories that I need to get through still, but I would love to add to that list. But thank you guys for watching, and I will see you tomorrow for another True Crime Courier video. Bye, guys.